As the official healthcare provider of Minnesota United, Alina Health is dedicated to delivering pro-level care for our loons. But our partnership goes much deeper than what happens on the field. From our shared support of youth-focused nonprofits like Roots for the Home Team to empowering adaptive athletes through the MNUFC Power Soccer Team, Alina Health and Minnesota United are committed to making our communities all together better. Learn more at alinahealth.org slash loons. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Sound of the Loons presented by Alina Health. And this time we are officially playoff bound preparation in full swing. We don't have to talk about wild card games. We don't have to talk about, you know, necessarily seedings anymore. Where, like the teams that are in are going to be in and the teams that are out are going to be out. Uh, actually, I should take that back because we have the we have the Western Conference wild card game tonight. We are recording this on Wednesday, October 23. 23rd. So there is still one team left to be determined, but um, we'll just gloss over that anyways. And I get to be welcomed. I get to be joined by Brian Dunseth. I was about to say head coach, Brian Dunseth. I don't know I why. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to flow right off my tongue there. Uh, Brian Dunseth, MLS commentator, obviously, but soccer guru, former player, national team, all, all of the above. We can go down the list, but uh, thanks for joining me. I know you've had a, a busy morning already. I appreciate it. I know you've got You've got boys, you've got a wife, you've got podcasts, you've got all sorts of things. So I appreciate you taking the time. No, of course. I just got off air with Sirius XM and I was working with Keith Costigan. So I'd much rather work with you than Keith. <laughs> I mean, his accent is thick, but it's not too bad. I mean, we've we've had worse, you know, where like if you don't see the person talking, it's hard. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. Keith, I, I love Keith. He's great. So he was moody too, because uh, <laughs> what I did find out is that his coffee shop is 30 minutes away. Uh, so he didn't have his morning coffee. And he's one of those like very specific temperature guys, which makes oh, him very God. pretentious when you're standing next to him because he's like, can I get my coffee at 169 degrees? He and actually like, says that? Oh my God, it's so embarrassing. Kendra. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll do the same coffee without the pretentiousness. So can you not spit in my drink before you hand it to me? Um, so yeah, he's like, I love giving my money to like small little coffee shops. I was like, Every time I've had a coffee with you, it's at Starbucks. Like, what are you talking about? So, well, yeah. and I appreciate, I appreciate supporting the small coffee shops. I mean, because we travel so much for work, there are often, sometimes Starbucks is just the ease of use because there's one on every block yeah. and you're in a hurry. But at the same time, um, I appreciate it, you know, kind of raising the bar, like keeping the small businesses afloat, but 30 minutes for a coffee and he lives in LA. I mean, that could be like an hour and a half. It's cost again. Um, oh geez well I have no sympathy I have no sympathy for him if he's going to complain about it um yeah so I wanted to ask you a little bit like you just probably talked a ton about it and I don't know I'm serious if you're I mean I'm you know I know you cover soccer globally but I'm sure you hit on MLS to a certain extent but when you look at the 2024 season and having played in this league for so long was there any one thing that surprised you the most? And I know it's hard to pick one thing. It could be something bad. It could yeah. be something positive. It could be a player, a team, an organization, a club. Like, was there any one thing that you were just kind of like, wow, I didn't see that coming? Um, To be honest with you, I, I, I think I'll smash it together. It's like the All-Star Game Leagues Cup and kind of like um, Campeones Cup. Like, just when you throw CONCACAF Champions Cup into that, like, these four tournaments, like these four international tournaments or, or formats that are happening in real time um, outside of league play. You know, we also have obviously the international calendar that you're having to, to, to figure out a way through. Um, having an international window that doesn't align on the backside, the ending side with a window still being open over in Europe. And I hope that's something that gets kind of dealt with in a positive manner going forward. It's just the growth of the league. And, and I know we end up sounding like homers when we talk about major league soccer. 
um, because those that think they are holier than thou have kind of this really exclusive view on the world's game and, and compare and contrast where MLS is. And yes, the reality is MLS is never going to compare with Champions League because you can't qualify for Tuesday and Wednesday nights. So it's something that they're not naive to. But just seeing kind of the growth and having, I told the story today, my first game was uh, July 4th, 1997. It was at the Rose Bowl, 98 degrees sang the national anthem. So that's how old school I'm going for those out there. Um, 98 and, degrees, not the temperature, no, no, no. the boy band. The band, Nick <laughs> and company back yeah, in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, you know, that was, I, I was a kid at Cal State Fullerton going to the Rose Bowl and having watched U.S. Mexico for the, the entirety of my childhood, then to go watch L.A. Galaxy as a as a freshman at Cal State Fullerton, and then you know less than a year later getting to play on that field to make an MLS debut, to see where the growth of the game is is extraordinary. And now to see you know San Diego Wave coming in or San Diego FC coming in, that's twice I've done that today. <laughs> San Diego FC coming in next year and seeing kind of like the investment of not only, you know, celebrities and, and athletes, but billionaires investing, multi-billionaires investing in our league. This, this year was just about the growth and obviously the spotlight of Lionel Messi and everything that's happening down in into Miami. But I think that's kind of a microcosm of what the continued evolution and growth is in Major League Soccer. Because while we'll absolutely talk about Lionel Messi, I think we should also referencing, be referencing kind of the rules adjustments and how the salary budgets are expanding and the nuclear arms race that is Major League Soccer. So, yeah, I think that's the thing that stood out to me most of like trying to step back for a minute and just recognize how quickly this league is growing. Um, and hopefully, you know, the contingency plans for, God forbid, one day when Lionel Messi isn't playing, how we can continue to maintain the spotlight and the growth that's happening in Major League Soccer. Well, I think the important piece is, you know, when I think about that, because obviously Messi coming to this league, it would like catapulted it exponentially, but the league was already on this path, right? Of this upward trajectory and who thought, you know, you think back, was it 96 or 94? I'm like mixing it up with the world cup now. Well, the league started, but then, you know, thinking like, okay, is this league even going to make it? Yeah. Is this even going to become a I thing? And Miami Fusion. Yes. 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 Yeah. And like you had like a handful of owners that owned like every team in multiple teams, you know? So I feel like this was on the upward trajectory, maybe the last decade for sure. More and more stars. You got the retired stars and the the current stars and the young players from other that want to use this as a stepping stone. Messi comes, which is phenomenal. But I also think that if you really take a step back and look at this league, that he maybe have gotten the eyes on it that never went to have watched it before or maybe paid attention to it. But then once the eyes were there, people understood that this is a league that is growing, that the quality is there and it's only going to get better whether he's in it or not. I mean, you can go to a Miami game and still watch Luis Suarez and Sergio Busquets and Jordi Alba, not to mention every roster that we could go down, you know, and the superstars that are there now. So I think that Messi was a huge piece, but it maybe got the eyes on it. And now it's like, can it continue on that path. So um, any decision day games that hmm. you were like, oof, wow, they really, they really did not, you know what I mean? Like you're like, yeah. wow, they choked basically. Cause I, I was kind of looking at the Charlotte DC game. Yeah. That to me was a game where I did not see that coming as we were watching the scores happening yeah. as our game was going on. I did not see that coming. And I was like, man, Troy Lusane is going to be furious, you know, the, yeah. with, with that. But anyone I mean, for and, you? And, 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 Imagine a DC United in a world in which Christian Benteke doesn't drop 23 goals, how bad that season would have been. I mean, that, that would have been, that would have been on target for what San Jose did in the Western conference. Um, yeah. For me, the big surprises were DC United and Philadelphia union. Yeah. I thought for sure. Both of those teams would have figured out a way credit to Montreal and credit to Atlanta United for sneaking in. Um, obviously I feel like anytime Manchester Miami plays, they're going to give up two goals and then smash a team for five. Uh, so I wasn't really surprised there. Um, Cincinnati's been dealing with a lot of stuff, both on the field and off the field. And so right now I kind of feel like they're just piecemealing uh, whatever's left of the season together. It's going to be interesting to see what that looks like. The, I mean, I could see a world in which Cincinnati and Columbus face each other in the next round. And at the same time, I could see a world where NYCFC and New York Red Bulls could face each other in the next round, considering how these playoffs work out on the West coast. 
man, the dive that Vancouver and Colorado yeah. have been on. The fact that we thought with the numbers statistically that Portland was putting out with that front three of Mora, Rodriguez, and Evander, that there's no way that they're in a playing game. Um, and then I thought Minnesota was left for dead. And mm -hmm. Eric Ramsey and what Minnesota United have done in the transfer window, putting together a team that's really strong defensively and having the momentum of being able to go on the road and dig out points when necessary, they're the ones that have, alongside Seattle, the trajectory has been really, really high. Um, but I was telling you before we started recording, uh, I call him T.O. Max. Uncle Max Bredos and I were, were out at LAFC for San Jose. And, and on paper, not a great game, right? Because, okay, it's second place team, not a lot to play for. San Jose's terrible. Unless three points and maybe a plus two goal differential came into play because Houston at home against LA Galaxy, LA had to win or tie and they secured the top spot. They have been, for me, the best team in the West all season long. And I was telling you the story. When we, Mar so this is all set up, right? Uh, last substitution was supposed to be Carlos Vela. First time back with LAFC. We think he's going to come on the field. It's like 10 minutes remaining. Aaron Long cramps up. They bring in Marlon, who signed the Brazilian who was at Shakhtar Donetsk when the war broke out. They bring him in. He scores in the like 89th minute or so makes it 3-1, there's the three points, there's the plus two goal differential. When the whistle blows, Houston is still winning one nothing. We're in live shot. You know when we go, we, we keep images for about usually maybe two minutes, we wrap up what it was, then we go to post game. Sam Fitzsimmons and everyone's like, stay live, stay live. And we're like, okay, well, wait, has the whistle not blown? I've got my laptop. Mm -hmm. I see the referee point to the spot and Gabrielle Peck's about to hit a penalty. So now everything changes. If LA ties, LAFC is in second place. He hits his penalty. Referee still is like 97 minutes. They end up going to 90 plus 11. Griffin Dorsey whips a ball in, and you should have seen the vibe in the stadium. At BMO Stadium, everyone's like, oh, okay, we did well. Okay, we got momentum. It's great. Oh, we were so close. The fans, all of a sudden, the fans are like, ah! <laughs> like looking around, like, what's happening? Daniel Stair scores in the 90th plus 11, scores against his old team, comebacks to haunt them. It switched back to LAFC, but to see the fans on the field while Bredos and I are like talking about it, they're looking around like, what the hell's happening? You guys just told us we're second place. And then to see it all unfold was pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, super lucky to be a part of that broadcast for that moment. And something I think will be kind of a reference point for LA fans, for LAFC fans for a long, long time. Well, and I feel like people, you know, if you're not a, a sports fan, you know, you don't really know what that feels like because it's hard in any other aspect of life and you can do all sorts of activities that aren't sports. But there are something about live sports and the adrenaline and the passion and the whole quote, you know, that's why we play the game. Like yeah. you just never know. And yes, when it comes to those scenarios, you're relying a little bit on what else is happening with other games. But at the end of the day, you still have to take care of your business. And I didn't see any post game quotes, but was Greg Vanny where the LA Galaxy coaches like, why do we have 11 plus why, why was there that much additional? I don't know. Was there controversy yeah. about that? I didn't even I, dive into that. Yeah, I didn't I didn't see. I think it was kind of like understood because okay. of the time that it took for the penalty okay. adding on and all that stuff. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it play to the whistle, right? I mean, yeah. it's a great, great goal. Um, and credit, just we had uh, Ben Olsen on our show yeah. and we were just talking about bogey teams, right? Every, there's always like these bogey teams, like LAFC, their bogey team is Houston. Uh, mm -hmm. LA Galaxy, their bogey team has been uh, Seattle. Like we have these weird things that happen, but in the playoffs, man, who knows? Yeah. And I feel like people want to talk about rivalries during the regular season. You know, some are manufactured and some are real and some have nothing to do with logistically, like how close you are to each other. It could just be past experiences, which I feel like creates more rivalries than like how close you are to another team, except for maybe LA and LA, just because that's sort of, you know, it's kind of built in. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, let's I want to dive in a little bit to the Minnesota United Real Salt Lake matchup because you, you know, obviously we're a Real Salt Lake commentator for a long time. You're you've got this match um, coming up here. Game one in Salt Lake. What what do you see from this Real Salt Lake team? What do you see? I mean, I love Pablo Mastroeni. Like I could listen to him. I've made my daughter listen to like our Apple coach calls because I'm like, are you hearing what he's saying here? Like yeah. this is this is good stuff, you know, as a human being, not just a coach and a player. What do you see from the Salt Lake team this year? Yeah, Pablo's great. My my son, Micah, sat in on a couple of the, the team talks, and I'll just look at him and say, 
See, it's kind of like it, it's all ages. It's like yeah, still the yeah. Pablo life. Like Pablo is great because you'd be like, yeah, Pablo, like you know the the tree is beautiful, right? And he's like, yeah, but like if you thought about like the roots <laughs> that are in the soil and when the sun just <laughs> with a little bit of water just gives this life and nourishment, and that's why the leaves grow so big. Right? <laughs> and you're just like, where's your mom? And I was lucky enough to room. I played with Pablo in Miami for the fusion. I got to room with him on the national team. He's just He's such a great salt of the earth human being. Um, all right, so it's complicated, but it's not complicated for Real Salt Lake. Uh, the complications were the decision to sell Andres Gomez. He wanted to move, the club wanted to move, the 13 million made a lot of sense. Fidel Barajas, they got him for 200 grand from Charleston Battery. They flipped him for 5 million effectively to Chivas de Guadalajara. Made a ton of money. But the team had some spots positionally that they needed to add to. Um, and obviously they went out late in the window. They should have got Diogo Gonzalez early in the window. For whatever reason, that doesn't get done late. So they miss about four games, including League Cup. We, I keep saying they got it right with Chicho because they got Chicho Rongo in two weeks before he was even eligible. Well, three weeks maybe. Mm -hmm. So then the adaption process on and off the field was that much easier. Um, this window, you bring in Lachlan Brook from Australia, Dominic Marchuk from Poland. Um, you get Javane Brown coming in. Um, from from Vancouver, he was let go. You have some competition for spots. And Diogo comes over for about five million from Copenhagen. He had started against Manchester United and Bayern Munich in Champions League play, so really high caliber player. But then all of a sudden, you're talking about like the mentality and the style of play and the DNA of what the locker room looked like, and the minutia of the detail was like within the structure. Andres Gomez and Chicho could kind of like freestyle a little bit, but still have the same shape. Whereas now, all of a sudden, you have to go a little bit more structured with Dominic Marchuk on that right-hand side. Now, Diogo, does he combine better with Chicho or does he combine better with Anderson Julio? And where's Matt Crooks in the mix of this? Yeah. And where's Diego Luna in the, in the mix of this? And by the way, a goalkeeping crisis because neither Zach McMath, um, you know, he doesn't want to keep the position. You have a younger goalkeeper that's 19 years of age um, that's trying to figure out what his lifeline looks like effectively you have two number two goalkeepers um and then all of a sudden as you guys saw in minnesota you've got a brian vera issue where you know the spitting's one thing the physicality is another thing um so it was a, it was a weird maybe four games post league's cup where they win their first game they lose their second game and statistically then they're out of the tournament so they never got to make a run they only got two games and they won one of those games. So you thought that they would have been primed for the knockout round. Um, so little by little, Pablo defensively figured out. They settled on the fact that Gavin Beavers was making mistakes in these three-game windows of a week, that Zach McMath was better suited. And they started to find some momentum. They weren't getting the wins that they wanted, but they weren't giving up the goals that they were conceding, kind of in that four-game structure. Um, so now, you know, they come away with a win against uh, Vancouver Whitecaps on decision day. They, by winning and Seattle drawing, not only do they break the records for most points in a season, they qualify for CONCACAF Champions Cup next year, and they get that third spot, which inevitably gives them a little bit of wiggle room for home field advantage. Um, but not much between these two teams. And right now, in terms of form, these are the two teams that you want to look at and say, okay, they're confident, they have an identity, maybe they have some weaknesses that they've been able to cover up, but this is a very even matchup from two teams that, you know, drew back in March, drew a couple of weeks ago, and now I have a little bit of spice for the way that Brian Vera elected to huck a loogie and find himself get suspended late in that game. So I want to ask about a couple of those players because you probably have the inside scoop and just based on your, your knowledge as an analyst, Pablo raves about crooks. And he said, this team would not be what we are without him. There's a noticeable difference when he is not on the field. He's not the guy that's going to show up in the score sheet, which we see with a lot of midfielders. But know. not a midfielder usually that's that high up the field because he's not like sitting back as a six. So what is it about him that makes this team make make it work? Yeah, it's, it's wild because you're spot on. Um, because I said in the front half of the season that Matt Crooks statistically – never shows up like very rarely shows up his pass you, you mean yeah yeah on the stat sheet statistically yeah, his, yes yes his, yes his effect yeah. is like yeah. the pass before the pass 
it's like the link up and the movement. And if you watch his running, I mean, he's six, four, he's like a baby giraffe galloping. all yes. the field. But in the structure, it was always, so I'm going to use my hand. So like, um, I guess I got to turn around this <laughs> right, be the right hand side. Right. Yeah. So it was always Andres Gomez was super, super high. So then you would have crook slide over a little bit more to the right. And then you have Luna invert himself. And then Katranis with the left back would flip all the way up. So you kind of had this like swing, pendulum swing. Um, so Crooks would always start occupying the like left side center back and 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 make the, the two defensive midfielders think about what his position. So his movement off the ball, I think what Pablo's referencing is what opens up the spaces for everybody else, whether Chicho yeah. drops, Luna exposes second runs. Um, but now it's looked a little bit different. And Chicho and Crooks, I think for Pablo and his staff, match up really, really well. But when you spend $5 million on a guy like Diogo Gonzalez, who alongside Chicho are technically the most talented players on the field, all due respect to Diego Luna, um, you know, like, what are your matchups? Do you want a guy with Anderson Julio that can stretch every single opponent, one of the quickest players and fastest players in the league? Or do you want an absolute finisher? And this is part of the juggling act in terms of, like, trying to figure out these guys' personalities while letting Diogo adapt in a similar manner that Hani Mukhtar had to adapt to the physicality of play in Major League Soccer with Nashville. Um, so there's nuances, but unless you're around Crooks day-to-day, I don't think you see the same things what we see as analysts, you know, between the lines for 90 minutes. Because I would have said, Crooks is out, Diogo's in, you play Dominic Marchuk on the right, you play Luna opposite, Chicho up top, there's your front four. Okay, so... I've got the head coach, Eric Ramsey, that's already in the waiting room. He's very punctual, and you and I like yeah. to chat. So I want to do two, like, three questions rapid fire. You know, do you just give me your your prediction? Who wins the Real Salt Lake Minnesota game, and what's the, the score of the first game? And then who wins the series? Uh, I would say that Real Salt Lake would have the advantage at home um, because at America First Field, they've been fantastic. I think Minnesota at Allianz Field is one hell of a test. For any team to come in and step because right now Eric Ramsey's got the, I think it's going to go to a game three. Uh, and then what? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's coming out of the West? Who's coming out of the East? And then who wins the MLS cup? Um, my shock theory was I would not be surprised if Columbus crew is hosting LAFC for a rematch. Oh my gosh. Uh, 2024, 20, 2023, 2024 MLS cup trophy. Uh, but I'm also not surprised if I'm wearing shorts down at Inter Miami <laughs> on the sideline, sweating my tail off, um, calling the game for Sirius XM uh, because it's Inter Miami and they just outscore every single opponent that they come up against. Well, and to be fair, they're not just incredibly talented, they're insanely competitive. Yeah. Like Luis Suarez does not like to come off the field and he does not like to lose. So you also have a group that's why they got to where they are is because they're so competitive. They don't want to lose at anything. I'm sure there's massive ping pong battles going on in that locker room as well. So, well, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm sorry I had to rush you off here, but you know, you know, I can't keep the coach waiting. We got to hey, tell, tell, you know. tell Eric I said hello. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thanks, Danny. I appreciate See it. Have a good rest of your day. You as well. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody. Segment number two with head coach Eric Ramsey coming up next. The Audi 2024 MLS Cup playoffs are here, and your loons are ready to fight for the title. It all starts with a three-game series against Real Salt Lake, and given the form of these two teams, we're set for some exciting soccer. Game two is coming to Allianz Field on Saturday, November 2nd. Get your tickets now at SeatGeek.com to make sure you don't miss out on this postseason action. All right, everybody, welcome back. Segment number two of Sound of the Loons. And now we get to be joined by head coach Eric Ramsey, who was kind enough to join us. We know it's an incredibly busy week, a lot going on. But first, I just have to get your feelings on hearing Wonderwall, a incredibly impressive win, a complete win in the last regular season game in Decision Day. I know you did a little, you know, shout out to the fans on the mic afterwards as well. So what was that feeling like for you as a head coach? We were really pleased that it 
it, it came together in the way it did because it felt like the perfect ending to the year uh, and it's the way that we would want to be sent off into the, the playoffs uh, by. So we were, uh, I think, as a, as a group, really satisfied with the way we were able to finish the year. We were able to um, right the wrongs of, of June and July where we all, I think, as a group of players and, and staff felt pretty hard done by for all the circumstances that we, we ended up experiencing given where it looked like we were heading um going into that that international break in the game against Dallas and and the Copper America so um I think to be able to finish this 10 10 game block as as the Western Conference's form team and and to have that experience at home in front of our fans and I've got to say I think from start to finish it felt like um the the biggest occasion that I've been a part of there kick, kicked off by the violinist that was really impressive that really set uh uh, a very unique atmosphere, I would say, and then and then from start to finish in the game, we were we were very good, I would say, minus a, a ten minute spell at the beginning of the second half, and obviously to finish in the way that we did, um, it felt like we we wrapped up the normal season really nicely. So I think we we left with um, a sense of of real contentment, I would say. When you talked uh, a lot at, during the second half of the season and that final third of the season about the depth of the squad, the quality of the rotation that you had, the ability to change up not just who's starting, but who's even available on the bench, how beneficial is that going to be down the stretch? Knowing you have a three-game series up ahead, you're going to altitude at Salt Lake. You know, again, like emphasizing the fact that there were some guys that weren't even on the bench against uh, St. Louis in your last game that you might be able to rotate in depending on how the, the series and the game is looking. Yeah, we want we want, and I sort of speak more broadly as to how things will look here moving forward. I suppose, and and um, where we built the early part of our success this season um, on top of, and it was that we didn't have, we haven't got a group that has um, huge superstars in, in the same way that maybe some of the the bigger spending sides in in these divisions would have. But we want a, a real sense of sixteen to 20 players that can really contribute at a high level here. Um, and I feel like we have that, uh, that bracket is, is tightening nicely now. And, and um, there was no more evidence or no more strongly evidence needed than, than um, what happened from sort of 65 minutes onwards in that game where you felt like um, we'd entered a little bit of a lull. We were able to make three changes and then immediately the team looked very different. We had that real sense of energy in, as you say, that could have um, extended far far beyond just those three players. And and now um, for, for probably the first time since I've been here, we're in a position where we've got players on, on uh, in the stands that have been contributors over the course of this season. So obviously I'm having difficult conversations with players early on in the year. I wasn't, but that is a sign of a healthy squad. And I've used the phrase of um, us having some healthy tension in the squad around places in the starting 11, in the squad. And that is, that's important. And that is a sign that we are doing things um, as, as they should be done for sure. When that goal was scored, where your three substitutes all played a part in the goal, Tanny, Fraga, and Sang Bin, and then Sang Bin also getting a brace on the night, which I feel like, you know, he needed a goal, right? He needed to find, this is a good point for him to get going again. What does that feel like as a coach, or you could tell by the reaction of the teammates, like the energy around that and Sang Bin scoring and how the goal was scored? Like, what does that do for a player like that? And also for you as a staff, kind of the feeling with that? Yeah, I think there's, there's sort of multiple layers to that. The first one is that the players coming off in, in that instance, um, Kelvin, Robin, Joaquin, very good players, players that can really contribute for us, players that um, over the course of my time here, I hope will be will be some of the higher performing players in this squad and in the league. They're coming off and they're not happy about coming off for sure. They are, uh, they sense goals, they sense, sense uh, the opportunity to go for the opposition, they sense statistics, but um, I felt at that point in the game, we needed to make the change. We made three, we made three, uh, and all of those players coming on made a real contribution and we feel like there needs to be a justification for for making changes in that way and there certainly was that and the players then leaving the pitch feel as though the change is justified they don't leave with a, a sour taste in their mouth in any way and the players coming on they contribute in such a meaningful way that then when I, I, I look at the group uh, ahead of the upcoming game now we feel like we've got forwards in form across four five six players which is which is really important for us and uh then just to touch on Sangbin specifically he's had a really tough couple of months with some family circumstances there's no more 
sort of well like the guy in the dressing room for everything that he brings in terms of attitude enthusiasm he's not a huge personality but um to a man in that changing room everyone would say that he's a big part of what we do here for his selflessness and um I, I was really pleased that he was able to number one come come on in the position that he prefers to play in to be close to the front and then to have the the, the moments that led to the goals and then the goals themselves they were they were big for him and big for us as a group for sure Last one about the past game before we move on to Real Salt Lake in the playoffs. But I kind of glossed over the the Robin Lud goal. But did you know that Calvin Yeboa had that kind of touch through ball right around the defender in the path of Robin? Do you know you, you know he had that in him? Yeah, he's going to need to have that in him for sure because he's, um, since he's come here, game on game, he's getting defended with more numbers, more aggression, more intensity from the opposition. So where in the opening games of his career, he's probably been able to catch a team uh, by surprise on a couple of occasions with his level of athleticism and um, and quality teams are obviously now sort of doubling down on defending him well. So it's, it's going to become, of course, about him in front of goal, but also about how he can bring other people into play and how he can start providing chances as opposed to just being on the end of them. So um, I think that was, in some senses, a... Uh, uh, an evolution of Kelvin where it's less less around him as the number nine, but more about how he brings other players into play. And, and Rob will hopefully benefit from that in the same way that um, Kelvin has really benefited from Rob and, and his craft in front of goal. And then looking at Real Salt Lake, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm completely off base here, but the last game that you guys played at Salt Lake wasn't the prettiest. Maybe not the way that you wanted to play. You got a result, a 0-0 draw on the road and in a difficult place to play at elevation, at altitude. But what's going to be different about this game for you um, against Real Salt Lake? Or what do you take from that last game to to change? Uh, I think I think we – so the circumstances, of course, are different in the sense that we played there on a Wednesday night, having played on Saturday. And then uh, we obviously are contending with altitude when you add to that that it's a second game in the space of four days or so. I think that makes, makes for – potentially ugly conditions we're, we're not intent on on going there and playing a pretty game that's not that's not what is required um in order to be successful there for sure they're a team that wants to have the ball they like to dominate at home so um we'd be it'd be naive of me to think that we're going to go and play a game that sees us be that team um particularly given the conditions there so we've got to make sure that we play in a pragmatic, adaptable way, which I feel like we've we've done well over the course of the last ten games, and and we we meet the conditions with everything that we can there. So um, I feel like we are really well prepared, obviously, for that game. We've got a break, we've got every player fit and available, largely. So we're 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 going into it in good shape, or certainly as good a shape as we can be. You still are uh, quite a few days away from game number one, but how do you approach it or do you differently when it is a best of three series, knowing that you're going to face the same team possibly three games in a row? Does that change the way you uh, approach the no, game? No, because I feel I feel like particularly in the US, particularly with the, the MLS in general, but then when you add in the conditions at Salt Lake, the conditions at places like Colorado, uh, away games can be so different to home games. So I think you, you, you just take each individual game on its merit in the way that we have done over the course of this last 10. This last 10 has felt like everyone is a cup final we've we, we we haven't had much margin for error as this 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 10 game season that I've termed it as has progressed we've felt like if we want to sort of claw back what we lost over June and July we've had to be almost perfect and and in fairness to the players we have nearly done that I mean we won 70 percent of the games um that this particular group has played and I don't think we had any god-given right to do that um when I sort of set that as an objective for us but what has sat behind that has been taking one game at a time, taking each game as a final, preparing very well for each of those games in really fine detail. And that's all we'll do for for these three, hopefully two. When you went into that last game, um, into decision day, and I know you're not necessarily like scoreboard standings watching as you're in the midst of doing your job on the sideline, but you guys has changed positions three or four or five times in the run of play, like during that game, fifth, sixth, seventh, you know, all over the place. Did you feel good about the matchup against Salt Lake when you found out that that was who you're going to be playing? Not that you're going yeah. to say, oh, no, it's terrible, but how no, do you feel about I it? I think you've, you've got – and this is – I'm definitely open by saying that um, i would be really respectful to all the teams that have hit this stage of uh, of the season because they're there for a reason. It's tough. Um, I know it's it's – 
relatively generous in the sense that a, a decent number of teams are able to make the playoffs, but it's also difficult to do. And I think if you look at um, some of the teams that haven't made the playoffs, the money that's been spent, the squads that they have, it is, it's a mark of... Uh, of a good team to have hit this point so there's no it's a cliche but there are are no easy games um, but we've had two good games against Salt Lake there isn't much between us um, obviously just logic would tell you that you'd rather avoid the, the top two Seattle uh, um, aside from us are the form team in, in the Western Conference so if you were to pick from the top four you'd be picking Salt Lake so I think the fact that we've um, we finished where we finished is is good for us but 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 by no means will we be taking this lightly in any way because we know from the from our experiences so far they're good teams um, they are a good team we've had good games and and we've got to make sure that particularly when we go there we are our, our absolute competitive best awesome well thank you coach i appreciate it i know you've got to run on to the next thing but i appreciate you taking the time and good luck in salt lake i know you got a few days before you head out of the town pleasure thanks kendra speak to you soon all right all right Saint. thank you Bye -bye. Bye. all right everybody that wraps it up for this episode of sound of the loons you can tune in next week when we do it again and of course there's going to be a match preview podcast as well uh, before the Royal Salt Lake game, game one of the three game series of this Western Conference playoff matchup. Tune in next week, everybody. Thanks.